Good afternoon. We're very honored to have as our guest today Michael Barone. As we all know, Michael is one of the most respected political analysts in the country. He's written for many publications, including The Economist, The New York Times, The Weekly Standard, The American Spectator, The London Telegraph. He is now the senior political analyst for the Washington Examiner. He is a resident fellow at AEI, and he's a regular contributor to Fox News. Interestingly, Michael coined the phrase gangster government to describe the Obama administration's approach to the Chrysler bailout, where the secured creditors got much less than they would have in a normal bankruptcy, and surprise, surprise, the UAW got much more. Gangster government has turned out to be an unusually useful phrase to describe many other of the administration's initiatives. Notably, Michael is the principal author of the Almanac of American Pub Politics, published every two years. The Almanac collects an ocean of statistics and has brief summaries of the political situation in each state and indeed in each congressional district. The Almanac has been described by George Will as the Bible of American politics. Reflecting that same religious theme, Karl Rove observed during the 2010 election cycle, quote, Barone's got me. He is a god. We worship him in certain circles. <laughs> Michael. Well, you, you can't beat an introduction like that. I'd ask you all to bow your heads. And, uh, <laughs> two years ago, I appeared before the Federalist Society before the election, and I began my comments uh, by saying, you can't win them all. Uh, this year, I guess the motto is, you can win some of them. Uh, and uh, we've really just been through two historic elections, uh, in effect, when, when you look at some of the numbers. Uh, you had a record number of uh, votes for the Democratic Party in 2008, and a record number for Republicans in 2010. And I don't think it's, it's widely realized, but go back to 2008. Uh, you look at Barack Obama was elected with 53% of the popular vote. That's more than any other Democratic nominee in history except for Andrew Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it's more than Harry Truman, more than John Kennedy, more than Woodrow Wilson. It's more even than Bill Clinton, uh, much to his dismay. Um, the uh, popular vote for the House 2008 was 54-43 Democratic. That may not sound like a huge number, uh, but in fact, it is, uh, it's the best Democrats had done since 1986 when they were winning most of the popular votes in the South, which of course they aren't anymore. Um, and it's the best Democrats did in the 36 non-Southern states since 1900, probably since ever. It was actually a record performance for the Democrats in the majority of the country that's not, that has not already fled high taxes for the South. Um, the, um, that was uh, a great victory for the Democrats. 2010, a big swing, 9% swing in the popular vote for the House. That's very unusual. We haven't seen a popular vote swing like that since the late 1940s, more than 60 years ago. Um, it, uh, it was the Republicans ended up with a popular vote majority of 52-45. Uh, uh, we haven't quite, California takes five weeks to tabulate its votes. They had an election in Brazil on October 31st. They had them tabulated within five hours. There, there is something wrong with this picture. Um, but nonetheless, uh, actually, they hired the guy from King County, Washington, that handled the 2004 governor election, the guy with the magic cupboard uh, that had as many Democratic votes as you need. He's now the Los Angeles County uh, vote counter. So um, you look at the potentials there. Um, it, uh, the, the Republicans uh, actually that 5245 is better for Republicans than they got at any time since 1946. And in fact, if you go back to 1946, you'll find that only 10% of the popular vote was cast in the South, which was then the most Democratic region in the country. If the South had voted proportionate to population in 1946, uh, as it pretty much does today, uh, the Republican percentage in 1946 would have been lower than today. Uh, so we're looking at something that hasn't been equaled at least since the 1920s, uh, and even Speaker Nancy Pelosi hasn't been around since the 1920s. 
She's old enough to remember the 1946 and 48 elections when her father was a member of Congress, uh, but not the 1928 election. Um, this is, um, you know, looking back over the years that I've written this book, Almanac of American Politics, or been co-author, uh, it's been 40 years now since I started working on it. Um, it's actually kind of unusual for a book like that to have been written by somebody who was four years old um, <laughs> the first time. Uh, but uh, looking back on that, um, I think we have two kinds of periods in our politics, periods of open field politics and periods of trench warfare politics. And trench warfare politics is when you have uh, pretty steady voting behavior. Issue focus remains uh, pretty much the same from election to election, and the results go along pretty much the same way. Uh, and we had periods of trench warfare politics in the 1980s up to 1991, and the political scientists came out with theories about why we would, uh, the uh, Republicans had a lock on the presidency, there were structural reasons for that, and that the Democrats had eternal control of Congress, and there were structural reasons for that, and it would always be true. Uh, and indeed, when you look at the election results from 1982 to 1990, uh, uh, it sort of looks that way. Uh, then we had a period of open field politics. 1991 to 1995, and all the old rules were broken. Uh, Bill Clinton was elected president in 1992. The Republican lock on the presidency was broken. Uh, in 1994, Newt Gingrich and the Republicans won a majority in both houses. Uh, Newt predicted that majority, and actually predicted the majority in 1986, 1988, 1990, 1992. <laughs> He had the right reasons, in fact. It just didn't happen until 1994, but um, it did, in fact, happen. Uh, and we had two uh, third-party candidacies in a country where supposedly the major parties, um, you know, there's no real alternative there, too. Um, we had Colin Powell leading in the polls against uh, putative uh, major party candidates in the fall of 1995, and Ross Perot leading in the polls in spring 1992. You remember Ross Perot then left that race, and. He said the first President Bush was going to send the Air Force in to strafe his daughter's wedding. Um, he uh, came back in the race. 19% 90, of our fellow citizens voted for this man, although he was obviously clinically insane. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, uh, that period went on um, for several years. Um, and um, then we had a period of trench warfare politics, 1995 to 2005 in which the two parties, both politicians and voters, were like two equal-sized armies in a culture war, fighting it out for small bits of terrain that made the difference between victory and defeat. The demographic factor most highly correlated with voting behavior was, uh, was, was religion or degree of religiosity. Um, this was the, uh, you know, I remember being at Fox News on election day 2000, 10 years ago, and, in New York, and we got the first tranche of exit polls in the key states, and one after another, they showed very close races within the margin of error. And I had a two-word comment looking forward to election night, of which I'll relay only the first word to you, which was, oh. <laughs> so, Brett Hume said to me, well, Michael, this election may not be decided until the wee hours of the morning. And I said, Brett, this election may not be decided for two or three days. Well, it took 36 days and a seven to two decision by the Supreme Court uh, to finally settle that election. Um, but uh, that was what we called, I called the 49% nation in the almanac of American politics. Uh, you had that very narrow band of support. You look for the popular vote for the House, the Repubs were about 49 to 51, the Democrats about 46 to 48 uh, throughout that period. The Republicans won more popular votes, more seats, but never by a wide margin. And Bush was reelected in 2004 by a 51 to 48 margin. Um, and uh, over uh, John Francois Carey, who many of you will remember. <laughs> you know, may we au contraire. Uh, uh, le windsurf. Anyway, the, uh, so um, 2005 that changed. Uh, we went from a period of trench warfare politics to a period of open field politics. We went uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the, uh, 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 the continued violence and increasing violence in Iraq, uh, and uh, uh, Democrats uh, uh, 
the issue focus changed sharply. We had, uh, you know, $4 gasoline suddenly changed people's attitudes on whether you should drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. Uh, prior to that, at $3 and $3.50, most people said we, we must proceed preserve the pristine environment. And at uh, $4 gas, they said, nuke the caribou. <laughs> drill, baby, drill. Anyway, as you know, in 2006 and 2008, Democrats had winning performances. Indeed, in 2008, as I've argued, something of an historical record. Um, in response, we had the political philosopher James Carville predicting 40 years. Uh, of democratic dominance. Uh, it turned out to be more like 40 weeks. Um, Republicans passed Democrats in the generic ballot question, which party's candidate do you want to vote for for House of Representatives in August 2009, which about 40 weeks after the election. Um, my view, the Obama Democrats made a fundamental miscalculation. They interpreted the Republicans' defeats not just as a negative verdict on competence, uh, but as a rejection of ideology. And they assumed that economic distress would make Americans more supportive of, or at least amenable to big government policies. I mean, this was the lesson taught by the New Deal historians based on the 1930s and 40s. I have argued that uh, that lesson was wrong, or at least incomplete, that you needed a more nuanced version of history. I provided one in my book, Our Country, The Shaping of America, from Roosevelt to Reagan, available on Amazon.com for $3.50. <laughs> And I would have rec I recommended it to President Obama, but uh, I don't think that uh, he's one of my purchasers there. Um, yeah, but it's uncanny. If you go back to polling in the late 1930s, the New Deal, unemployment was you know, hovering well over 10 percent. Uh, voters wanted uh, less government spending. They thought uncertainty about tax and regulatory policy was uh, uh, stopping economic growth and presenting inv preventing investment, creation of new jobs. They thought labor unions were getting too powerful. Sounds kind of familiar, actually. Uh, you look at the other Anglosphere democracies in the 1930s, they rejected big government parties in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and in Canada. Uh, so I think that the Obama people were basing uh, their assumptions on erroneous history, and certainly um, the verdict of the last couple of this election uh, is very clear. Uh, it's a rejection of the vast expansion of the size and scope of government uh, by the Obama Democrats. I mean, they banned the use of the word stimulus in the campaign. I guess you can use it if you appearances by former President Clinton, but the, uh, the auto bailout, uh, well, Michigan voted for 58-40 for a Republican governor. Um, the health care bill uh, jammed through after voters pleaded with the Democrats not to pass it through the medium of national public opinion polls and through the unlikely medium of the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, the Democrats passed the most unpopular major piece of legislation that I can think of since the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Um, the, uh, that resulted in the destruction of one political party and the relegation of minority status uh, for decades of the other. Uh, I'm not sure that this is going to have that much of an effect, but it's obviously um, a big rejection of the big government policies. And I think the most fascinating development of the last couple of years, and it's fascinating to me because I didn't predict it, you know. If something happens that I predict, it's not like I'm learning something, I already knew it, but if something <laughs> happens that I didn't predict, then I have an opportunity to learn is the emergence of uh, what is called the Tea Party movement, the inrush into political activity of hundreds of thousands or even millions of people around this country, motivated by concern over bailouts of people that behaved imprudently, motivated by concerns about the doubling of the uh, national debt as a percentage of gross domestic product, the increase in federal spending from 21 to 25 percent of GDP, and motivated as well by the words and deeds of the Founding Fathers. Uh, I've, I think this is a reflection of a wider trend in society. Over the last 15 years, we've had books by the Founding Fathers that have been bestsellers. Uh, if you went to the beach one summer, you saw everybody reading a biography of John Adams. I mean, who would have thunk that? Uh, uh, but the fact is, um, we're going back to the theory of the Founding Fathers. And I think you can see the politics of the last couple of years as a test case between the theories of the progressives and the New Dealers on the one hand, 100 years old, 70 years old, and the theories of the Founding Fathers on the other, 220, 230 years old. Uh, and, you know, the progressives and the New Dealers said that the Constitution and the Founders uh, 
you know, horse and buggy theories. They were out of date. In a modern industrial era with big factories and technological marvels like the Model T, um, you just couldn't have limits on government. You needed to have centralized experts, uh, command and control government systems to guide ordinary people who really aren't very smart anyway. We didn't know them at school. Uh, in order to uh, get, make their way through life. Uh, it encouraged a culture of dependence. And I think what a majority of voters were saying in this year was that that stuff sounds kind of tinny and old fashioned. Uh, it's like, you know, pre dial phones and Model Ts. That's not the most up to date thing. And that the words and actions and theories and ideas of the Founding Fathers still ring as true as a silver spoon on a crystal goblet. <laughs> So um, I'm not going to go over all the results. We still have a few uh, House races that are left unresolved. Uh, they've counted the absentee ballots in Alaska, and they've, you know, sort of a spelling lesson up there. How many could spell Murkowski? It appears that uh, the pork Republican there beat the kosher Republican. Um, the uh, one way to describe them. Um, you know, after the 2008, some liberal commentators were saying the Republican Party is restricted to a few places in the Deep South, the Great Plains, they're, you know, battening down in their strongholds. Uh, now you can say that the Democratic Party is, uh, is restricted to a few uh, strongholds. Basically, the 2010 tsunami was pretty much prevalent uh, between the George Washington Bridge and the Donner Pass. Uh, <laughs> It left the cannibals standing at both ends. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Democratic strongholds are now where you have super strong public employee unions. They've got the state governments in California, Illinois, and Florida, who may be coming, or Florida, New York, rather. It's all the New Yorkers who went to Florida, but they, uh, <laughs> The, uh, in some of the states in New England, I think some of these uh, state governments may be coming to Washington because the uh, bond market uh, vigilantes aren't going to lend them any more money. Uh, it will be interesting to see what their reaction is from the Republican House of Representatives. Um, maybe some delicious moments there. Uh, if you look at congressional districts where Democrats are still strong, uh, black voters, they're still very strong with them. Um, Hispanic voters, though, it's a mixed bag around the country. Hispanic voters in uh, Florida voted Republican. Hispanic voters in Texas gave Republicans large minorities of the vote. Um, the real strength of the Democratic Party in the heart and soul is that I think my friend Joel Kotkin calls gentry liberals. And since you people are affluent people living in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, you know just who I mean. Uh, the, uh, they've even, you know, take, threatening to take over McLean in Great Falls, Virginia. Um, and uh, the affluent liberals who were concerned about issues of voting on issues, of cultural issues, foreign policy issues, Nancy Pelosi's district in San Francisco is a clear example. Uh, let me just conclude with a couple words about 2012. Uh, and I think that it's risky in a period of open field politics to make straight line extrapolations from any single set of election results, including those of 2010, however tempted one may be to do so. Um, you know, the, um, Barack Obama in 2000 does not have a horrible job uh, performance rating right now. It's negative, but only slightly so. He's probably not going to have primary opposition except perhaps from uh, a left-wing candidate of the peace uh, movement wing of the Democratic Party. Um, he's, um, I think most Democrats will be reluctant to challenge him in the first black American president in primary contests, which averaged 50 20 percent black electorates. Um, balance of enthusiasm, which favored Republicans, obviously, in this cycle, may not favor them as much again. Uh, and uh, we'll see a more robust turnout of black voters, most likely. Uh, all those singles apartment developments in Washington and Arlington and Alexandria, they're all infested with Obama voters. They may come back out and vote. Um, the, uh, and I think there's going to be a reluctance on the part of many Americans to reject the first black president. I think that's an understandable uh, feeling in light of our history. Uh, so that's, and there's a presumption sometimes in favor of incumbents. It helped Bill Clinton in 96, helped George W. Bush in 2004. Uh, nonetheless, I think that we do have a pretty clear uh, verdict on here, and it's not just a negative verdict on the uh, 
a uh, bad economy, which has, of course, caused people to relinquish science and reason and just bitterly cling to gods and gun, God and guns, um, noted political observer's theory. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think it represents, Americans have not been presented with the realistic possibility of a vast expansion of the size and scope of government of this sort in a very long time. I would argue, you think you can make the argument that they haven't been faced with this since, since the end of World War II, when we saw voters in the UK go for the labor government, national health insurance, nationalizing industries. President Roosevelt, uh, in one of his last State of the Union addresses, called for national health care, public housing, getting rid of the private market and housing, federal aid to education, big takeover of health care, and so forth. The Congress is elected in those big swing elections in the late 1940s basically rejected that program and limited the scope of labor unions. Um, that was a decision that made possible the prosperity of post-war America. And I think Americans seem to be re uh, reacting uh, once again uh, as they did then uh, with a robust rejection of a vast expansion of the size and scope of government. Thanks very much. Okay. We do have time for a, a couple questions. If you have a question, uh, please make sure it's to the point, and uh, we'll call the question in a couple minutes. But, sir. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what's happened in uh, state legislatures around the country? We had a panel that talked about constitutional reform. Is there a possibility that there might be a conservative enough uh, as a group of state legislators to propose uh, conservative constitutional reform? Well, the. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the answer is yes, there may be enough wacky people to do that. I mean, the, uh, no, it's interesting. Um, you know, the Republicans gained six Senate seats of a little fewer than they uh, thought uh, they might do. Uh, they gained 60 plus House seats, which is about what I was predicting and what some of the other predictors came to, uh, which is a little more than 94. In 94, with the same percentage of popular vote for the House, they gained about 450 state legislature seats. This year, they gained about 680. And in state after state that I've looked at where I followed the local prognosticators of the political insiders like Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Republicans overachieved what almost all the insiders were predicting. They picked up state legislative seats that nobody thought they were going to get. Uh, and sometimes when you do that, you don't know what the heck the people that won those seats are going to believe. Uh, so I think the answer is that it's, it's a wide open field out there in state legislatures. Um, Republicans have emerged in a good position for uh, redistricting, uh, as you know, many of you political buffs know, but I think, uh, you know, and they, they, they've got an opportunity in state governments to throw a lot of sand in the gears of Obamacare, which is not a self-propelling vehicle but needs fuel and fiddling with and so forth. Uh, constitutional things, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I think like most of the people in this room, uh, I have a party affiliation. It may have changed uh, over the years. Uh, Mine but too. I, yeah, but, but I wonder, who are the independent voters? Uh, what, why can't they make up their mind? Why do they seem so changeable? <laughs> well, the independent voters, you know, were about, uh, you know, 57, 37 for Democratic House candidates in 2008 and then switched uh, toward Republicans. Um, I think one reason, uh, you know, people don't make up their mind is sometimes they vote on events and on competence. I mean, I think the rejection of the Repubs in 08, 06 and 08 was a rejection of competence, not ideology. A lot of people, including a lot of Democrats, would disagree with me, and you can argue about it, but I think the, the election results fortify that pretty well. Uh, and I think that... Um, the vast expansion of the size and scope of government that the Obama Democrats presented the American voters with as a realistic possibility, as something that could really happen, was, I think, a case of first impression for most voters. We hadn't really faced that. I mean, you could ask voters sometimes, uh, you know, health, would you like to have the government pay all your health care bills? Well, yeah, that sounds kind of nice, you know. You ask young voters that, they say, yeah, it's like university health service, you know, you get free counseling and condoms, that's great. Uh, the uh, you know, we've now got, you know, they're touting the provision of the health care bill that lets 26-year-olds uh, go on mommy and daddy's health insurance. Um, they don't say that in order to hold down costs, there have to be certain limits the government will insist on. And you know, late-night behavior can be hazardous, uh, auto accidents, unwanted pregnancies. They have to be home by 10.30 on weeknights. 
and 10 and midnight on weekends if you want to be on mommy and daddy's health insurance. So, um, you know, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, people respond to events and they respond to cases of first impression and they don't always respond in the same way. I live in New Jersey. I have a question about Governor Christie. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, Governor Christie won the straw poll among the Tea Partiers a couple of months ago, but I think what a lot of people forget is It was he a was, weighted average. Yeah, he was... Yeah. <laughs> he, he came out of a Republican primary when he ran for governor where he was not the conservative party candidate, he was not the Tea Party candidate, and what do you make of you sort of, you know, uh, the fact that Christie is so popular right now, and he's, you know, he's being portrayed in the media as, I think, being much more conservative than he is. Well, I think the uh, part of it has changed in issue focus. I mean, it's trench warfare politics of so, uh, 95, 05, the issue focus was a lot, a lot, particularly within the parties on a lot of these cultural issues. So you had Mitt Romney in say, 2007 going around the 99 counties of Iowa saying about how he'd always been against abortion, which inconveniently wasn't entirely true, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, he, was, he was doing that because that's, that was the litmus test you had to pass to get a re, win a Republican presidential nomination in the trench warfare politics period. The issue focus stayed steady. What we see now is we see a series of issue focuses which suggest, among other things, that Romney would have been wise in 2008 to campaign on the financial system and his business expertise. Uh, skip Iowa and the, uh, you know, the caucus goers meeting age 72 and go to New Hampshire uh, and so forth. Uh, that's the advantage of hindsight. But when the, issues, when the issue changes to the size and scope of government, then Chris Christie, who was not thought of in 95-05 terms as one of the you know, far-right conservatives, but nonetheless facing those budget decisions and taking tough decisions against the teachers' unions, taking umbrage when they uh, envisaged with glee the idea that his, he would die, uh, that, uh, you know, he... Uh, he took them on, and he's taken them on, obviously, in these public forums. The medium of YouTube enables us to see him in all his full glory. And, uh, you know, it, it, different issues will put people at different places in the perceived ideological spectrum. Last question. Uh, you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the correlation in 1995 to 2005 of uh, religiosity being a, a key element of voting behavior. Do you see any uh, resurgence or return to that type of correlation in the 2010 results? Well, there's still a high correlation of that. I mean, the, you know, if you look at really the class of Republican uh, voters, you find that they're culturally conservative. Uh, they tend to be, not all of them are. Uh, and, you know, Democratic voters tend to be culturally liberal. I think those issues are just of a lot less salience to voters now, and I don't see them being revived lately because this vast expansion in size and scope of government is an ongoing issue. Obamacare, unlike Hillary Care, uh, is still alive. Uh, nobody has yet put a stake through its heart. And uh, so that's going to remain an issue. Uh, gee, you know, we've got a 10% uh, deficit in uh, budget, federal budget deficit, 10% of GDP. So that's a raging issue. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you listen to the political philosopher Glenn Beck, which I'm sure you all do. Uh, they asked him about same-sex marriage, and he said, I don't want to talk about it. There are more important things to talk about than that. Uh, and I think that's emblematic of a lot of feelings. Mitch Daniels, the governor of Indiana, who won 5840 in a state that Barack Obama was carrying, 2008, uh, ran one point ahead of, uh, Obama, of uh, Ronald Reagan in the state's most affluent county, carried 20% of blacks, 37% of Hispanics, and young voters, 5142. Mitch Daniels said we should have a truce in the culture war, and a lot of people objected to that. I think we have a truce in the culture war right now. People are not yelling at each other about these issues uh, anymore because we're faced with a different set of issues that most voters on whichever side of the issue uh, think are more salient uh, and more pressing and the subject that they want to cast their votes on. <laughs>